everyone and welcome to our panel today on uh, Can Housing Be Affordable, Resilient, and Sustainable? Now for any of you who are working on Larry? any one of the components the of this, you know that it's very complicated and there are uh, many things underway, many wonderful programs, and also much to do. Go ahead. So, I first would like to acknowledge off. all the work that's being done on affordable housing, resiliency, and sustainability. Um, I also want to thank uh, Congressman Jim Hines so much for, I'm going to turn the mic over to him in just a minute, um, and very much thank you to Andrew Karwaski and his staff for all his help with this briefing, giving a room for us, which is so helpful, but um, I had the pleasure of meeting Andrew, I don't know, about a year ago, and we talked about a lot of these issues, and I just really appreciate that you are doing on this and the Congressman's leadership on these issues. As a member of uh, the House Committee on Financial Services and the Subcommittee on Housing and Insurance, uh, you're touching some of the most critical issues that we're facing today in terms of affordable housing, energy efficiency in that role, <coughs> excuse me, um, efficiency's role in affordable housing, and, uh, and financing and many other issues. Uh, so what I would like to do is uh, welcome the congressman to, uh, I know he's busy and um, perhaps would like to say a few words and then uh, I will introduce uh, the panel, but but one thing I did want to say is that what what we have here today is really an amazing uh, group of panelists because given the issues that we're facing and the complexities of these these issues and the fact that yes there are barriers that still are out there that need to be resolved, but you know what, folks, these folks are making it happen. These people, Trin Klingenberg from Passive House Institute is designing low energy buildings, know how, know how buildings work. Uh, Orlando Velez applying this to affordable housing in D.C. through Habitat for Humanity. Nicole Steele applying solar technologies on affordable uh, homes. So this is all about bringing it together, and I see some folks from the High Performance Building Coalition um, that are working on this. It's all about bringing these issues together. So while any one of these things is very difficult, um, we can have better luck if we figure out where those synergies are and how to bring them all together. So we'll talk more about that. I'll introduce our panelists, but again, I would like to welcome Congressman Hines from Connecticut to say a few words and thank you again for all that you're doing. Well, um, thank you, Ellen, and thank you all for being here today. I thought I might just um, create a little bit of context uh, with a little bit of a bias towards what's happening here uh, or not happening here um, in terms of uh, in terms of sustainable and, and, and resilient uh, and affordable housing. Um, look, the answer to that question is yes. Uh, it can be. It must be. Uh, it better be. Um, you know, I represent Fairfield County, Connecticut. We got hammered in Sandy, right? And of course, just south of us is uh, New York City and Staten Island and, and Long Island. And of course, there's nothing particular to the Northeast with respect to weather events. And uh, uh, if we don't get a lot more serious about thinking about both sustainability and resiliency, uh, we will waste a lot of money. Uh, the answer to this is yes, I know, because before I got into this business, um, I um, was uh, an executive enterprise community partners. Uh, some of you will be familiar with enterprise with LISC. It's one of the kind of key intermediaries for um, the low income housing tax credit, in particular working with um, community-based organizations with the tax credit to try to build uh, affordable housing. and. Um, uh, yes, at some level it's complicated, at some level it's not, um, in, in the sense that, uh, uh, you know, particularly in places where you're not building Greenfield in the Lower East Side of New York or in Baltimore or, or in Philadelphia, um, where you're probably rehabbing uh, housing stock that could be anywhere between 30 and, and 100 years old, you almost can't help 
but build more sustainably, build more affordably um, than what was there. I, in the Lower East Side, I, I, I use that example because we would take a 12-unit tenement um, that, would, that was built 100 years ago and coal was pennies per ton uh, and therefore insulated just the way you might imagine it would be insulated. And without any fancy lead, uh, green building, uh, without any fancy stuff, just making some very basic uh, changes. We could cut the energy consumption by that, of that uh, structure by as much as 60%. And that, of course, is a cost savings, which depending on the affordability uh, program you're talking about, in many cases gets conveyed to, through to a, a lower income family, uh, savings on, on, on their monthly cash flow. And of course, it can be healthier. And I don't need to suspect to tell people in the room that when you're talking about communities of, uh, of, of poverty, you're talking about high concentrations of asthma and other environmentally related health effects. So yes, it can be, and boy, it better be. It's, a, it's one of those few win-win-wins out there where you can actually reduce people's expenses, improve their health, model um, <clears throat> model uh, the kinds of building techniques that will allow other uh, developers and other construction people to actually take a look at what it is that you have done and then, and then, and then do that. Um, and, you know, one of the, I wish I could strike an optimistic note about what you're likely to see out of the U.S. Congress with respect to a real meaningful commitment to moving the ball forward here. I, I can't do that. Uh, the single most important vehicle we probably had for pushing energy efficiency, sustainability, the Shaheen Portman Bill, with which some of you will be familiar, of course never made it out of the Senate. Uh, and I don't see any reason to believe that there's going to be a big push after January to prioritize that. That is sad. But two things are less sad. One is um, an awful lot of this stuff, of course, is happening quite apart from uh, what we may or may not do statutorily here. You know, the um, Sustainable Communities uh, Initiative at HUD, uh, the kinds of thinking that, that HUD is doing in terms of, you know, trying to, for the first time, really blend the concept of communities and, uh, and place and sustainability with the old let's build affordable housing mandate, I think is, is, is really very hopeful. What individual communities, cities and towns are doing with respect to inclusionary zoning, uh, giving uh, points for sustainability, there's, there's really good news and good things happening. There's private developers. Um, my favorite example is Jonathan Rose. Those of you who know the Northeast will know Jonathan Rose. You know, private developers who are really profoundly committed uh, to sustainability for all the reasons that I'm outlining here. So the good news is, even though you're not going to see a ton of leadership, a ton of uh, momentum uh, out of the U.S. Congress on this issue, um, good things are happening. And my sense is that you know there's a role for everybody. Uh, we will, those of us who care about sustainability uh, and affordability uh, and resilience, we will continue to push uh, ideas that will that will move the ball forward. Um, uh, everything from you know, giving points uh, for the award of tax credits uh, for, you know, the inclusion of sustainable uh, uh, technologies and, and building techniques to, uh, you know, pilot programs that would, uh, that would demonstrate, hopefully make underwriters, credit underwriters, more comfortable with the idea of operating savings associated with, uh, uh, with reduced energy expenditures in, in, in our built environment. Um, <clears throat> now, just one slightly optimistic note with respect to the Hill. Um, this is not... Efficiency is actually not, it's not keystone, it's not the war on coal, it's not the really angry partisan side of things. You know, you, uh, you, uh, you'll be hard pressed in the vast ideological spectrum that exists in this institution to find people who will say it's a terrible idea to promote efficiency. Um, so one big question of course is what does, <clears throat> you know, what does the new, uh, what does the new uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell do uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to take him at his word that he's going to look for areas of common ground, uh, which, he, which he said shortly after the election. This should be one of them. Um, and I'll just close with this notion. It should be one of them. Again, it's not Keystone. It's not the war on coal. It's not all of those highly partisan, highly charged uh, political debates. This is efficiency. It's really hard to argue with. And therefore, and this is my concluding hope and, and, and perhaps a request to you all, um, keep up the advocacy. Because I, um, uh, I would tell you that... Uh, uh, there's really no reason why the Hill should be stalled uh, on these issues. Um, again, as, as some of the anger and the partisanship bleeds out, maybe we can find room for, uh, for a more kind of 21st century commitment to, uh, to the statutory change that will allow us to do um, 
you know, nationally and with the scope of the federal government, what we're seeing communities and states and uh, municipalities do. So keep up the advocacy in the 535 offices on the Hill and of course in the state houses and in the municipalities uh, out there and with HUD. Um, <clears throat> I think even though, uh, you know, none of us really enjoyed watching what happened to Shaheen Portman and, you know, other initiatives, I, 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 I think there's a possibility for, for moving this forward uh, uh, with enough advocacy. So uh, thank you. Uh, I guess I'll just Okay. Thank you so much. And now you know why we uh, at the ESI like to let our uh, panelists and our experts uh, speak for the issues. Uh, uh, this is actually our 30th year of bringing briefings to Capitol Hill and trying to bring the experts and the science to policy making. Um, so, uh, thank you, Congressman, for those remarks and a very positive message. Um, yes, that's, that's what we want you to come away with, that this absolutely can be done. Um, and uh, so, on that note, and I, I should mention also that uh, I'm seeing a lot of uh, leveraging. So, with the HUD programs and the money that, um, the, the uh, funding that does come from HUD, for public housing. I think we're seeing a lot of innovation, uh, including from folks on the panel, in leveraging that money. And, and that is very important today. That's a message that I think resonates on both sides of the aisle. And it's uh, certainly the, the savings that come with energy efficiency that can allow us to do other things like resiliency, more green features. Um, I think it all goes hand in hand. So uh, to get on with the show, um, I'm uh, real pleased to introduce our first panelist, Katrin Klingenberg, is co-founder and executive director of Passive House Institute U.S. Um, he has promotes the adoption of passive house building principles in North America. Many of you may have heard of the German passive house uh, standard. Um, Katrin is working uh, with uh, experts here, her board, and with the Department of Energy and NREL and others to um, adapt that standard to the U.S. climate, which as you know is very different than in Germany. We have a lot of hot and humid areas that need, um, need cooling and dehumidification. Um, so uh, Passive House Institute U.S. is doing training of uh, uh, building professionals and train the trainer program so that we really can scale this up. Because what we uh, what we have is is really the probably the most rigorous uh, methodology or standard for reducing energy use in buildings, reducing that load. And building uh, buildings in the U.S. use about 40 percent of our total energy use, 70 percent of the electricity. Um, Passive House really is getting that. Um, heating, cooling, energy use way, way down so that um, other uh, uh, things like solar technologies can be added cost effectively and we're really getting to that net zero or near net zero uh, ready buildings. Um, so in 2003, uh, Katrin designed and built the first home uh, that met the Passive House building energy standard in the United States. She has designed and consulted on numerous Passive House projects and served as an instructor. She's a licensed architect in Germany. And thank you so much, Katrin, for, for being here. Passive House is in, in Chicago, so I'm glad you made it here. Safe and sound today, please. Thank you, Ellen. Um, I'd like to uh, start with uh, expressing my gratitude to you for arranging this today and bringing this topic to everyone's attention. And thank you, Congressman, for uh, showing your leadership and hosting this briefing. Um, this is really uh, kind of like uh, the, the concept of the briefing uh, was to showcase that the technology really is here. As the Congressman said, um, yes, we can do this. It is. Uh, housing is affordable, resilient, and sustainable today. And uh, uh, the three speakers uh, that you're going to hear uh, here 
Uh, our chosen would like a plan in mind. Um, I would present the path of building part, the building science, and quality assurance. We're bringing that to the table. Um, Nicole uh, is bringing to the table the renewable side of things. So passive building is kind of focusing more on the conservation side of things. Renewables are focusing on the generation side. And then Orlando with Habitat, who uh, has been an incredible leader in uh, moving all this forward. You will see that he will present on a project that was one of the very first demonstration projects that put all these pieces together. The conservation piece of passive building standards, extra low uh, energy consumption to begin with as a, as a baseline for zero energy. Then of course they couldn't stop there, they had to push it uh, to the next level and they added uh, zero energy to their project and uh, they also made it a beautiful design and that home is located in Washington DC, you might have seen it. So uh, with that, uh, quickly a few words to uh, the uh, Passive uh, House Institute US. We actually started out originally as a housing developer uh, very early on, and that's how we built the first proof of concept homes uh, in Urbana, Illinois. And uh, that was uh, interestingly also the place where uh, Passive House actually uh, was born, if you will. Uh, a lot of folks think it actually happened in Germany, but that was uh, already the second round of passive building development. Uh, the first time around, all the principles were actually already uh, dis well, discovered. It's not really uh, more so. Uh, it's not really disco discovering the principles; it's uh, uh, defining them, and they were defined in the uh, Department of Energy grants uh, in the 70s and 80s as a response to uh, the energy crisis. So. As uh, the Passive House Institute US, uh, we are doing uh, certification and training, and we're bringing to the table the quality assurance piece. It's a simple concept, but it's important that you do it right, that you have a, a concept of uh, employing all these techniques and principles. And to illustrate that, uh, I'd like to talk quickly a little bit about the uh, passive building uh, metrics and the principles. Uh, then about uh, a little bit about the, the work that we're doing currently with the Department of Energy and redefining those standards for North America. Alan was uh, alluding to that uh, a little bit for varying climates. Uh, quickly, I'll show you a few uh, multifamily projects. Uh, passive uh, building is indeed moving full force into the multifamily sector right now. I have some great news to tell about that. We have uh, now about seven fully certified projects around the country, which is excellent, and most of them are affordable on the good side of things as well. And then uh, quickly, just a summary uh, to highlight the benefits of um, dialing in to this baseline of conservation first before you add renewables. All right, um, you are probably all familiar with the, the uh, statistics. Um, the chunk of uh, energy consumption that uh, the United States uh, is contributing to worldwide uh, use of energy and how that breaks out in uh, terms of uh, commercial, residential, and industrial. And uh, there we see very quickly that buildings have a huge potential to reduce uh, energy consumption overall. And uh, this is a slide right here that uh, is already a few years old, but I think it still holds true. It's actually uh, put out and published by uh, the Shell Corporation. And uh, it is uh, looking ahead to uh, almost the, uh, well, and to the end of the century, really. They're not just looking until like 2030, they have a very long range view and uh, they're saying like, yeah, okay, our resources are dwindling in terms of fossil fuels and we need to come up with alternatives. And that's really not a bad thing, that's really a good thing. Uh, we have quite a bit of potential here for renewables, but those are somewhat limited. Um, there uh, is a certain cost associated with it, resources are limited. So what they are expecting is that the chunk of energy that will come from conservation, that will have to come from conservation, will grow as the worldwide energy demand uh, grows as well. And uh, you can see right here that this, uh, that uh, over the course of the century, uh, they expect uh, the fossil fuel resources to um, kind of go down and be replaced by renewables and uh, conservation. And that is Shell, that is, uh, that is an energy company. Yes, they are looking forward. So quickly to put this in perspective, uh, passive building is a, essentially the equivalent to the miles per gallon for buildings, the energy consumption per square foot of living area or conditioned floor area. And uh, how does that compare? So uh, the first energy standards uh, started in uh, 75. Uh, compared to that, we see, of course, a very drastic reduction, but then also all the other uh, energy efficiency programs that we have, Energy Star, uh, the IECC 2012, and the DOE Challenge Home, Energy Star version 3. Actually, now it's called Zero Energy 
ready home. Um, uh, even compared to this very high level, high performance home program of the Department of Energy, Passive House still uh, offers a great reduction here, like with 65% uh, of total energy use. And that is significant. Now, very quickly, the, uh, the principles here, I don't have to go into like the actual uh, nuts and bolts and building signs of things. But uh, the principles are not rocket science. This is very simple, kind of uh, very reasonable measures that uh, some of them might still look familiar to you from the early days of passive solar homes and so on and so forth. But uh, of course now this time around, um, they have been uh, more optimized and uh, in fact the passive solar portion of things is playing a way lesser role than it used to be the first time around. It's a more optimized system of all of these different components which are continuous insulated envelopes, minimizing thermal bridges, airtight construction, uh, constant fresh air supply, um, uh, managing uh, internal loads and once you have done all that correctly you have maximized your conservation, your potential, then you look at uh, very efficient technologies like heat pumps and so on and so forth, uh, solar uh, thermal hot water generation or uh, geothermal uh, and then once all that is optimized then you add your um, solar system to generate your own uh, energy and uh, by now that system is a very affordable system and that's of course like that's then the next frontier we don't want to stop at zero we want to overproduce like uh, we want to make take the next step uh, not only to a sustainable energy economy but to a positive energy economy we want to overproduce um, this is uh, just a quick snapshot of kind of like uh, how we verify if a building actually meets those criteria i don't have to bore you with the exact numbers they are very stringent a very simple uh, process uh, that then uh, kind of shows very quickly does the building meet those criteria or not. not. So there are, there are modeling tools that do that for us. Uh, and with that, quickly a few words to the cost optimization that we are working on currently with the Department of Energy. So in here I have it right, uh, Zero Energy Home uh, uh, Ready uh, program from the DOE. Uh, we have been partnering with the Department of Energy since 2012 and in 2013 we were awarded a, um, um, a grant, Building Science Corporation, Building America partner, and we came in as an industry partner to uh, redesign those passive standards, which initially we started to use the European standards and that was a very specific, very moderate climate. And as we were uh, applying those standards in the US over the last 10 years, we've been doing this 10 plus years now, we started having some uh, uh, unintended uh, consequences occurring and we had to adjust for that. As Alan mentioned, there are additional complexities like uh, cooling requirement, humidity and so on and so forth and also the building science of wall assemblies as soon as there's moisture involved. Now, uh, under this program, we have uh, developed a very stringent uh, quality assurance process that delivers these projects. That is very important. It's, it's a simple concept again, but uh, you need to do it right and there's a method to, uh, to uh, applying these uh, principles correctly. Um, our certification program combines design verification as well as on-site verification so that you make sure that uh, what was specified during the design process is actually happening on-site. Because that building is designed with such, such precision, uh, some small uh, mistakes might in the end make a big difference. Like for example, what if the wrong insulation material had been delivered and they just installed it and they didn't pay any attention? That can make a big difference. Now, uh, over the last uh, couple of years, we've seen uh, a nice development in certifications. Uh, you can see right here the hockey stick developing that we have always been hoping for, but also uh, have been fearing a little bit, because like what, what happens if that all of a sudden really grows and takes off? And it really looks like uh, we are now seeing this kind of like part of the curve where within a couple of years we could have like thousands of units. And uh, quite frankly, these are only the certif certified projects. There are quite a few more out there. Not everybody goes for certification. It's voluntary. And uh, these numbers also include um, uh, multifamily buildings. So the uh, multifamily buildings with 60, 70, 80 units, they don't show up as units. They show up as a building. So if we account the fully certified projects, uh, all the units, and then in addition we have about like 200 more in the certification phase, uh, we're probably already at about like a thousand units and that's certified, not even counting the units that are, that are being built like uh, uh, on their own. So that's, that's a great success story for, uh, for 10 years and it clearly shows that the training has 
um, shown success and that people do take those principles that they learn and they go out there and they build these um, prototype homes in their communities. Um, the Department of en uh, Energy, I work with them, of course, so that uh, relates back to standard adaptation, making the standard more fitting to the North American context, construction costs, and uh, energy prices. Uh, what we found applying the European standard was that one standard fits all, pushed kind of like the application of uh, insulation in some climates way beyond the point of uh, return for, for the investment. And um, you would find yourself actually uh, somewhere up in here if you try to use the European standard in, in, in certain climates. And that's not the point, right? We don't want to waste resources. We want the right amount, the cost-effective amount of conservation first. So um, uh, under the study that I mentioned earlier, Building America program with Building Science Corporation and Department of Energy, uh, we developed new climate-specific standards. And they're going to be released here uh, very soon. Now that takes me very quickly um, just uh, to a couple glimpses uh, for you to look at the projects that are uh, in the works right now. And again, great leadership has been shown here by a few uh, community housing development organizations. Uh, one of them is Action Housing in Pittsburgh. And they have been a great leader. They jumped right in in 2012. They're already done with one uh, SRO development, single room occupancy retrofit. 80 some units, uh, that one is fully occupied by now. And then uh, this is their latest project, uh, 24 unit uh, development for uh, foster children. When they, once they move out of the home, they, um, they get their own apartments. And uh, these are really excellent buildings. This is actually close to being finished now. They are using very nice materials here as well. This is a, this is a very nice project if you're ever in Pittsburgh. Uh, I encourage you go and, and see this project. Uh, other developments are on, on the way. Uh, Portland, Oregon, now a uh, different climate here. Uh, this is a, uh, a development which is built to market rate. This is an 18-unit uh, building. And um, this is a building in New York City that uh, recently got a lot of press, uh, was mentioned in the One City report that Mayor de Blasio put out. Uh, this is the Nickerbocker Book project, uh, architect Chris Benedict right here. Uh, very nice as well, 24 units, I believe. They, these are all certified and they are meeting the passive standards. Uh, and then uh, just a quick few words to uh, policy and what we are seeing developing around uh, the country and uh, in the world. Uh, believe it or not, Belgium uh, was crazy enough to actually say a few years ago, yes, we're going to make this code in like 2015, beginning this coming year. Every single building, even retrofits, will have to meet the standard. And uh, that is quite a challenge. Um, they are tackling it head on. Uh, I don't necessarily see that method working in the United States. So I think uh, what we need is some nice carrots and more like a consumer-driven uh, market transformation, but that's just an example uh, how Belgium uh, dealt with that topic. And on that note, I don't have a slide in here because we don't have limited time. Here in uh, in the U.S., uh, the Pennsylvania um, Housing Finance Agency in uh, September decided to award 10 extra points to passive house projects. So right now, in their application pro uh, process for LIHTC. Uh, for uh, low-income housing tax credits. Uh, they have a whole bunch of developers all of a sudden looking at passive housing. They're all trying to meet the standard because they want these extra points. Now, that might be a little bit premature, but that's an example of uh, how, um, how this could work, how we could incentivize this without having to come with a, with a stick. We just basically put out the carrot. And a quick summary. Um, so uh, of the various measures that building that can drive uh, building performance towards net zero, it seems that passive measures are indeed the most desirable. Uh, we have seen that these principles are applicable everywhere. They are applicable to all building types, uh, residential, uh, commercial, as well as multifamily, as well as retrofits. And uh, we have uh, uh, additional benefits uh, to just the energy efficiency side of things, and maybe those are even more important. Uh, one of them is resiliency. Resiliency in terms of uh, kind of like uh, climate uh, occurrences, but also cost of living, uh, less uh, energy costs. Uh, we have increased comfort and health. Um, so those are all aspects that play into this type of construction. And last but not least, we have also learned our lesson. Uh, this is a highly climate-specific 
uh, kind of uh, principle. And, uh, but once we calibrated based on the climate and based on the energy cost and the construction cost, we can actually dial it in and we can make it the sweet spot between supply and demand. And from that jumping point off, we can go on to uh, zero energy and then uh, positive energy generation in our buildings. So yes, it's here, it's possible. Thank you. Thank you, Katrin. She makes it sound so easy, doesn't she? But actually, it, uh, it, it is a, a matter of uh, good building science, good building practices, and so we're feeling positive that we'll be able to scale this up. Um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, defines affordable housing as that which uh, uh, is not more than 30% of uh, one's income. And uh, so when you think about uh, building to a, a greater degree of quality uh, and efficiency and other performance measures, we, we have to think, okay, how do we, how do we make this happen um, with that constraint? And some people are even challenging whether that's appropriate given the cost of childcare, healthcare, food, you know, the, the definition really is based on uh, using housing, uh, what you need, uh, uh, you don't want to spend too much on housing so you can't get those other necessities. Um, but given transportation costs, um, you know, location, uh, where you live, accessibility to uh, uh, services, that's, that all factors in. So um, we are uh, very delighted that some people are tackling these, these, uh, these issues and trying to get good quality into uh, affordable housing. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce Orlando Velez, Director of Housing Programs and Community Advocacy for Habitat for Humanity DC who is really putting these uh, concepts into practice. Um, Orlando has uh, received his degree in architecture from Kansas State University, joined the Peace Corps, and served in Paraguay. Uh, he worked for a small municipality and directed many projects. Uh, and then, after the Peace Corps, attended uh, Milano, the New School for International Affairs Management and Urban Policy Analysis. So he's, uh, he was working on his graduate degree in urban policy and uh, was asked to work for, uh, for the university as director of operations for the Empower House project. And Empower House, with uh, a, a team, was the Empower House project was the winning entry in uh, DOE Solar Decathlon in 2011. So that was then the segue uh, to DC Habitat for Humanity. And uh, you began working as manager of, uh, of housing services. So I will let you tell the rest of the story. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I would like to thank Ellen again uh, for and everyone here and especially the panel and the congresswoman for uh, coming here today and letting us uh, have this great discussion on how housing can actually be resilient, uh, sustainable, and also be affordable. Um, as Ellen did mention, I was working with uh, the new school uh, on the project called the Empower House. We did win uh, most affordable house, which was our goal. Uh, we were very excited to win that and take that from the Solo Decathlon competition. Uh, we also won a couple other awards from the competition. Uh, we won the best lighting design and best hot water design. It's actually the, the competition, which is really ingenious. Uh, and then, uh, then when we brought it back to D.C., we actually won uh, an award, D.C. 2012 Mayor Sustainability Award. But I'll get to that in a moment. Um, so a little bit about Habitat for Humanity in Washington, D.C. I'm sure everyone here has come out to volunteer, right? Um, so we're a developer, a uh, construction company, and a mortgage servicing provider as well, uh, as well as social servicing agency. Uh, here in the district, uh, we are only the D.C. Habitat affiliate, so we have many affiliates throughout the country. 
Uh, we work, uh, we have about, um, we even have overseas affiliates, so about 80 countries out, outside of the U.S. have uh, Habitat affiliates. Uh, we've been established since 1988 in the district and working with over 200 families and over 4,000 volunteers. Uh, we've partnered with hundreds, uh, if not close to thousands of schools, nonprofits, other agencies, uh, community groups, churches, and other organizations, including corporations uh, and other nonprofits. So what is affordable housing here in D.C.? So I'm going to focus a little bit about uh, D.C. itself. Uh, so in 2014, this year actually, um, uh, Real Estate Business Intelligence stated that D.C.'s median sales price is $500,000. Uh, that's a six and a half percent change increase from last year. Uh, so obviously $500,000 is not affordable to many, uh, definitely not to me. Uh, the AMI or the area median income for a family of four in DC, which is calculated by HUD in DC, it's $107,000 for a family of four. Uh, Habitat actually works with families earning 30 to 60 percent of the area median income. So we work well below that. Uh, and this is a home ownership program. We don't rent the properties. These buyers actually purchase the homes and they own it, including the land. Uh, in DC, uh, we did a study, Habitat did a study in 2013. Uh, nearly 20 percent of DC families are at poverty level. Uh, and half of D.C. households are actually paying 30% or more of their income on rent. And of that half, 20% are paying 50% more on rent. Uh, as Ellen had mentioned, according to HUD, paying more than 30% of your gross monthly income on housing is actually considered a burden. Uh, so a quick math, sorry to do this to you guys, of how we make this affordable and how the Habitat can actually do this builds be building more because we're constantly growing uh, and service the population. So in this case, we have a house at $270,000 and we have to keep the debt to income ratios. So that's the 30% of the gross monthly income uh, that cannot go toward, that goes towards housing costs. And then there's a back end, which includes all your other housing or other costs, uh, such as your credit card payments or student loans. Uh, Habitat, we work with uh, third trust programs and second trust programs. So in DC, we have a program for first time home buyers, which is called the Home Purchase Assistance Program, uh, and they, right there, the HPAP program. And that's a loan to the buyer uh, that's up to $40,000 right now, it's 0% interest. The third one is actually the most unique for DC. Uh, it's called the Housing Production Trust Fund, and there are many other funds, part of funds, but in this case, we actually have, this is a real live project, and this is a real live third trust. So the Housing Production Trust Fund comes from the Department of Housing Community Development here in DC, the DHCD. And it's actually monies that's captured through, um, uh, through DC's deed and recordation and transfer taxes, and is used for home ownership or rental for low income or moderate income uh, DC residents. This money is our financing gap as well. So we're able to take this, we're able to fundraise for the construction costs of let's say a typical house and then get that additional gap from local funds, funding sources like the Housing Production Trust Fund and build this to a passive house standard and not burden the cost onto the buyer themselves because they also capture a piece of that funding from the developer that's given to the developer by the Housing Production Trust Fund and it's recaptured back into the buyer. So now the buyer can use this third loan of $60,000 at 0% interest and it's non-amortized. So the key here too is to keep this house affordable. So there is, in, under the Housing Production Trust Fund, this home has to be affordable for a period of 15 years. So the owner can't just sell it and flip it. This particular house actually is, we did an appraisal, it's worth $400,000. So the owner can't actually just take that house and then sell it at market rate. They have to sell it for the same area median income they were in when they bought it. And that's for 15 years, it's a covenant that goes with the property. So we have to make sure that the front end all this math, the property taxes, insurance, and paying back the debt is less than 30% of this buyer's gross monthly income. And this is somebody at 50% of the area median income. So they're earning about $53,000 a year. 
So in DC, uh, we did a study as well on energy costs uh, in Northeast DC where we were building. Uh, we found out that on average, uh, energy costs the homeowner about $2,300 a year, so roughly $191, $200 a month uh, in just heating and cooling loads, in heating and cooling, uh, uh, both energy, uh, electric and gas. So if we add on a passive house, that saves us almost $1,900 a year, bringing it down to $480 a year in just energy costs for the homeowner. And we could take that to the next level. So we're using this, the Housing Production Trust Fund, to get to this level as a developer. And the buyer is using that as well to, get, to purchase the property. And with GRID, we're actually able to get to the next level now. So we're actually able to go into site net zero. And that's zero utility costs for the homeowner. So that's saving about $200 a month. And this is where we did it. So we were the first developer in the District of Columbia to do a passive house project. We actually did two. This was the project that Ellen was uh, talking about briefly about. This was the entry to the solar decathlon, the 2011 solar decathlon. So in this case, our third trust, although it wasn't Housing Production Trust Fund, it was actually Habitat doing that third note. Uh, the land was also given to us or sold to Habitat through DHCD, Department of Housing and Community Development, uh, at a low cost. I think it was about a dollar. Of course, there were covenants with that as well, such as the 15-year resale restriction. So the house maintains affordable for 15 years if they ever choose to sell it. So it's through that partnership between uh, the local government agencies uh, and DC Habitat uh, that we're able to build these homes. This is just an inside photo of the home when it was actually on the National Mall. And then here are the mechanical systems. So these homes are very airtight, super well insulated. They're passive house built standard homes. So we have an energy recovering ventilating system here that brings in the fresh air from the outside and then filters it with the air from the inside, exchanges the heat, the hot water heater, and then here are the solar panels to actually bring it up to that next level. And if you don't believe me, this is the owner's bill. So the owner used to pay about $200 a month. Now she's paying, this is the most expensive bill she has, 30 bucks going from $200 to $30 a month. That's a huge savings. And we look at it, I did a little bit math that I did not want to bore you with on the slide. Uh, but a little bit math on this, actually this owner I want to add to, uh, we are working, we worked and we're still working with the local housing authority agency, DCHA. Uh, to get families from their fa uh, family self-sufficiency program, the FSS program, that uses the home choice voucher, the um, Section 8 rental voucher, and then converts it to a home ownership voucher through that program, and get them moved into one of these passive houses. So the idea is that, uh, and it actually came true, the idea is that uh, the homeowner's utility bills and the housing payments would be so low they will no longer need that voucher. And this actually did come true. This homeowner moved in about a year ago, and since October, they did not need that voucher. So that's actually saving and recycling that voucher to a new participant, because vouchers are no longer, uh, there's a huge waiting list. So now it's freeing up more vouchers to more potential uh, homeowners. So if this buyer, this homeowner saves and pays down their mortgage, their first trust mortgage, which is uh, the bank loan, $180 a month, paying it down, they'll actually pay off the mortgage in 21 years instead of 30 years and save about $50,000 uh, just in interest costs alone. That's a huge savings uh, for somebody who's actually in 43% of the AMI. So currently, we decided to Habitat, TC Habitat is taking this to the next level. Um, and we're using the Housing Production Trust Funds to bring that to the next level. Uh, we're actually building six passive houses here in, Dean, in, uh, excuse me, in D.C. in a neighborhood called Ivy City uh, in two different phases, phase A and phase B. And what you here see here, this is Central Avenue, if anybody knows D.C. a little bit. 
uh, and then here is phase A. And in this phase, we actually did, we were able to partner with grid alternatives to take this to the next level of site net zero. So in these homes, although they're sold for $270,000, we're still hitting a lower AMI because of that housing production trust fund, because of that connection, that partnership with the local housing authority, uh, excuse me, the local uh, housing and community development, uh, and as well as with the local housing authority in finding buyers. So a family buying one of these properties will actually just pay about $838 a month on their first trust mortgage. So it's financing about $169,000 at today's interest rate of 4.3. If they, once we put, in, we put in the solar panels and they're saving on that average of $200 a month, paying down the mortgage, $200 extra a month, they're saving about $50,000 again and going to pay that mortgage off in 21 years instead of 30. And that's where we're at. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Orlando. So I, it sounds like to uh, scale this up, we just need to clone you and have you do all these complicated financing deals everywhere. Uh, that's very impressive. Thank you so much. And a great segue to uh, uh, Nicole uh, Steele at uh, Grid Alternatives, which is, I call it, and I'm sorry if this is not, you'll just correct me if I'm wrong, but it's sort of like Habitat for Humanity with solar. I mean, you're doing, it's a similar model in terms of volunteers and, uh, and making this work for affordable housing. So it's, it's a wonderful program, innovative program. And um, <clears throat> you just opened this year around the United States. I think in uh, California is maybe the home office. And this office just opened in the Mid-Atlantic. And Nicole is executive director. Um, and you... Uh, Prior to this, we're with the Alliance to Save Energy, and so energy efficiency, then solar, um, goes together as a system. Um, and uh, uh, so Nicole has over 10 years of experience in environmental and energy um, issues in urban planning, uh, grassroots advocacy, <clears throat> policy development, and other disciplines. Um, and then you were also the director of the efficiency, Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant Program, uh, which was part of the 2009 uh, American Reinvestment and Recovery Act era, uh, the stimulus program. Um, and that was for uh, Loudoun County, Virginia. So that, uh, that's really where the rubber hits the road. Uh, designing, commissioning, implementing 12 separate energy-related projects, ranging from capital improvements to feasibility studies and education. Um, and so I will maybe stop there so you can actually talk. Uh, so welcome, Nicole, and thank you. Thank you, Ellen, and thank you, EESI, for having us and letting us answer this question again. Yes, we can make housing resilient and affordable and sustainable. Um, I also want to thank the congressman, even though he's not here. Uh, we recently opened an office in uh, New York that covers Connecticut, so we're very excited for um, possibilities up there in the New England area as well. So essentially, yes, we are uh, Habitat for Humanity a la solar. Um, we are a nonprofit solar installer that works exclusively with low-income communities. We do go up to 80% of area median income, so that's a little bit higher than Habitat standards, but obviously we partner with Habitat around the countries. We have a very, very strong partnership um, in all of the areas that we have offices. Um, our sort of big, large picture mission is that we want to make sure that uh, clean, renewable energy is accessible to everyone. So while we are a nonprofit solar installer, we're here to be the go-to for making our new clean energy economy equitable and diverse. Um, so with that, I will 
figure out how to use this thing. Okay, so um, we were founded by Eric Mackey and Tim Sears in Oakland, California. Um, that was about 10 years ago, and we've been incredibly successful across the state of California because of state-level incentive programs that uh, essentially uh, Grid Alternatives uh, implements for the state of California. So it's called the SASH program. We started piloting that in 2004. Um, and uh, we have seven offices across the state of California. But um, about two years ago, Wells Fargo came to us and said, you know, we're really interested in what you're doing. Um, we like your workforce development model. Um, so the other thing that we sort of add on to the, the volunteer um, habitat model is that we also do job training and that it's very important to the mission of GRID and making sure that we're able to funnel um, us, people through us into a skilled workforce. So um, we're able to partner with those types of organizations around the country as well. So anyway, Wells Fargo saw this happen and said, let's figure out how to make this work outside of the state of California. So two years ago, we opened an office in Colorado. Um, one year ago, we opened an office in New York that covers New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. And just this past September, um, we opened an office here in the Mid-Atlantic that's physically located here in DC, but we cover DC, Maryland, Delaware, and Virginia. Um, we kind of we call this office our showcase office because it is here in Washington DC and we want to be able to have this conversation on a national level. Um, so we made a call for a national low income solar policy when we opened our office here in DC in September. Um, what does that look like? We don't know. Um, we've been doing this for 10 years and we're very creative about um, the way we finance the systems, but I think really the next step is continuing to figure out how to be creative and finance the systems and making sure that it is accessible to everyone. So like I said, we are a full service nonprofit contractor serving qualifying low, low income homeowners. Um, we do a lot of pieces of the puzzle. So we're not necessarily just the installer, we do client outreach. So we go into the communities and determine who would be um, eligible for the installs and who really need to, um, would benefit the most from the installations themselves. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about energy efficiency earlier. Um, you know, the big statement coming from the Alliance to Save Energy, who's for wasting energy? And I mean, obviously that's step number one. So uh, we make sure that energy efficiency um, is included in the package that we use in energy efficiency education. It doesn't make sense to put solar panels on a house that is not energy efficient. So that's certainly something that we pay attention to when we talk to clients and um, if their house is not energy efficient, we will connect them to resources that will help them um, go down that path. And so we all, ultimately we provide a turnkey solar installation, um, meaning we hand over the, the system to the homeowner and it becomes theirs and they can see how it works and we provide a 10 year uh, loan guarantee or 10 year warranty um, and I believe it's a 25 year equipment warranty. So if anything goes wrong, we're there. We're able to come out and take a look at, you know, what's going on and making sure that um, we don't just build the system and walk away and something goes wrong. We want to make sure that it is something that we can leverage for years to come. And then I did mention that we have this workforce development model where it's essentially a classroom on the roof. Um, we have a team leaders program where we're able to bring volunteers uh, through an, an entire process where they demonstrate um, uh, that they're capable of doing all the different processes of the installation themselves. Um, and then once they do that with our solar installers on staff, and we do actually have a solar installer here in the room, um, that person officially becomes a team leader with uh, GRID. And then once that happens, they qualify to take the solar installer exam, um, which is actually a really big step in the solar industry. So we have a bar partnership with NASCAP and we make sure that um, people have that opportunity to really be able to funnel into the industry. So what have we done so far? Um, we, we have that sort of hockey stick picture that Katrin was talking about earlier of, you know, we did a couple installations 10 years ago and then the last couple years, the last five years really, um, it's gone way up exponentially. So we've done 14 megawatts of installations across the country, um, well, where our offices are located. And uh, those are essentially on single family homes. So those are 
lots of systems across the country. So that equates to 4,800 systems essentially um, to date, uh, which ultimately is $133.5 million that is uh, generated for the lifetimes of these families that are receiving those systems. So um, it's an incredible impact. Um, on top of that, uh, we've trained over 19,000 volunteers um, during the process of the installations, equaling 420,000 um, tons of greenhouse gas emissions prevented. So, so why, why are we doing this? Why are we focusing on affordable housing? Why are we focusing on low-income communities? Um, like I said earlier, uh, you know, our overall mission is to make clean, renewable energy accessible to everyone. Um, uh, lower income communities are disproportionately impacted by their energy bill. And so by being able to decrease their energy use, um, we're giving them the, no pun intended, the power to sort of direct that funding elsewhere, whether it be back into their mortgage or um, to put, you know, healthier food on their tables or uh, sports equipment for their children, whatever it might be, that they do have that funding that they can direct elsewhere. And also at the same time, they also um, are sort of susceptible to higher energy costs depending on where um, they're located. So, uh, and really we're seeing this as uh, a move beyond sort of the early adopter phase. Grid was created because Erica and Tim were engineers installing solar in California and they recognized that the market would not be able to mature without it being accessible to all different um, demographics of you know the United States so really building a program that uh, allows solar to be accessible to lower income communities helps mature the solar mar market overall uh, so I talked a little bit about the workforce development portion so this provides a hands-on experience um, for you know solar jobs in general. I talked about the team leaders program. I do wanna say as the executive director of the new uh, Mid-Atlantic office, I came on board and was excited to hire a couple installers um, to hit the ground running and have found that actually it's very hard to find installers in the area because uh, the solar industry is growing quite ra rapidly and other solar companies are scooping everybody up that's available. So this is actually an industry that's looking for a qualified workforce that GRID can come in and help um, build that pipeline. And so really we will partner with community colleges, other nonprofits, veteran organizations, um, local governments, et cetera, to really sort of make that happen. So I mentioned we have you know, had 19,000 individuals receive the hands-on experience, which are volunteers. You don't have to have any experience to actually do the installation with GRID. You don't even have to know how to use a hammer. You can just come out and do an install and we will teach you how. Um, there's a roof team and a ground team. And so if you don't want to be on the roof, you can be on the ground. But safety is our number one um, priority. And so I expect each and every one of you to come out and volunteer with GRID now that we're here in the region. Um, but I do really want to point out that we have had over 1,500 paid job opportunities created through those volunteers in our team leaders program through GRID over the last, uh, I believe that's over the last five years. And that actually, that statistic is from February. So we've created more jobs since then. And this picture, I've just, I have a soft spot for this picture because that is the passive house install in Ivy City um, with Habitat. So GRID really sees ourselves as a collaborator. We come into the community and we want to work with everyone. Uh, we work with the homeowners, we work with the solar industry, uh, we work with affordable housing agencies, much like Habitat. Um, there's a number of others in the area. Uh, we need to work closely with the local municipalities to make this work. Um, uh, we you know, talk about creative financing, like we're not in California, so we're having to leverage um, more local incentives that are that is are not from the same sort of sash program that's provided in california um, we have corporate sponsors we do corporate workday builds we partner with job training organizations foundations and other volunteers so you know financing our model is sort of the question it's like how do you make this work in across the country and i think that's really where we need to focus on it's like 
DC has the best SREC market in the country right now. What's an SREC? Solar Renewable Energy Credit. Um, and that we're able to leverage those SRECs to help cover the cost of the system. However, that only covers a small portion of the cost. It covers about a third. Um, fortunately, we're able to work with third-party financers to um, monetize those SRECs up front so that we can help cover the cost. Um, but the SREC market is not meant to stick around forever. So um, the, the value of those SRECs will go down in a few years. Um, another piece that we use here, or will use here in the Mid-Atlantic, is um, the federal income tax credit. And so we're actually able to monetize the federal income tax credit um, through the same third-party financer um, to help us uh, add a little bit more to the cost of the system, um, which you know sort of gets us to about half. Uh, so then we're looking at corporate contributions. I mentioned we do corporate work days, um, similar to Habitat and other nonprofits that uh, bring teams out from companies around the country that are interested in learning about solar. What's great is to get solar companies out and get people that work for a solar company and have actually never touched a solar panel before. It's kind of fun to see, um, you know, how it all sort of shakes out, but we also get grants from foundations and municipalities, much like uh, many nonprofit. Uh, one of the other big pieces of the puzzle is that we have a large portion of in-kind donations for our equipment. Um, I believe the stat recently was 68% of um, all of our equipment was donated. Um, so essentially we serve as a massive aggregator for the low income community um, that also sort of uh, you know, brings it to a very, very inexpensive level. Um, and then we receive donations like any other volunteer would from individuals and other volunteers. So, um, you know, I, th I think our sort of uh, call to action here uh, today is to really sort of evaluate um, those pieces of the puzzle that we just talked about and how we can um, sort of figure out the best path forward. So we're doing a number of pilots in all of our different offices across the country. Um, so is it something that we do piecemeal um, at the local level? Is it something that we need to focus more on the national level? Um, the reason we have our offices in the areas that they are in is because third-party financiers are interested in those areas. There is already a strong solar market um, or there's you know, a strong solar SREC uh, system or there's local support and so we want to be able to move into communities that don't necessarily have that local or state level support that um, some of the other areas around the country have so i think that's the sort of the thought that i'll leave with the, the group today and that really sort of exploring how to make sure that clean renewable energy is accessible to everyone um, and figuring out how to finance that so thank you Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, so I would like to open up for questions. I'm sure, I, I know I have a lot, but this is your time. So, um, so for any of the panelists, uh, please uh, feel free to um, ask questions. And if you would state your, your, your affiliation first, that would be wonderful. Um, anybody? Yes, sir. There's some good benevolent, benevolent uh, person or persons uh, who are not retaining the, the, your three organizations to do something. Could you survive? What would you do otherwise? Uh, does it require a grant from some entity for you to actually get in and fix up the house or build the house? Or uh, Is there any way of developing a model in which you can work with individuals or actually folks to do their own houses uh, or does it require assistance from above or outside or beyond? And I can, I can speak specifically to the solar portion of the conversation. Um, I mean, ba basically the, the pieces that I just talked about, um, we are trying to make those cover the entire cost of the system. Um, we have a number of pilots, um, particularly in California, 
or Colorado, and I think there's one in New York, um, uh, piloting PPAs, essentially where Great Alternatives is a stand between organization and we do a prepay for the homeowner um, so that because the homeowner doesn't have the credit that would be required um, for to obtain their own PPA, which is a power purchase agreement. So um, sort of the lease to pay back system. Um, and then we also have a pay it forward program that's sort of layered on top of that where um, uh, the, the homeowners that receive the systems actually do pay a small portion of uh, the cost of the system, but we calculate that based on um, the savings that they would receive from the system, so it would never be more than 50% of their savings, um, so they would always be cash positive, and so we would redirect that payment back into um, future installs. So we're working towards a model, and ultimately that is that is the goal is to figure out how to um, make this a self-sustaining model that's not uh, dependent on grants or donations to, can, to keep us running, essentially. Uh, well, I'm, I'm happy to say that we are self-funded. <laughs> We're funding ourselves mostly through training and certifications. We get individual donations, but that's not really where most of our funding comes from. And that comes from like a, a lesson, a hard lesson learned actually from our friends first time around, the super insulators and passive solar folks. Um, they told us the story uh, of the early 80s where funding all of a sudden went away, like uh, solar and solar thermal was in full swing and all those subsidies, the carpet was pulled out from underneath them and the entire kind of industry that was just starting to grow collapsed. So we've been uh, from the beginning trying to make the case that uh, whatever we propose needs to be economically feasible and this is why I showed this kind of like cost effectiveness curve. We need to be able to make the argument that the improvement will pay itself back over a certain amount of time that is reasonable. And only then we can actually, like I think, promote this as like a lasting change. It needs to sustain itself. It needs to be a value proposition for the folks who are doing it. Are there any kind of federal finance team programs that have been particularly successful? There's kind of a 203K program that uh, has its power saver program through Title I. Are there any, have any of those programs been useful or are there other sorts of models out there that have been particularly useful in terms of federal access to financing to the federal government? So I will just say from the federal government perspective, um, we've been leveraging the federal income tax credit that's specific to solar, the makers. Um, and that'll end or sunset in 2016. Uh, so it's really only available for two more years, unfortunately. Um, so that, I mean, that's a conversation that we can continue. Um, there's uh, programs that we've been partnering with um, HUD and DOE to see, you know, how we can facilitate the work that we're doing, um, whether it be through uh, solar curriculums and job training partnerships with un local universities or actually installing solar on HUD properties. Um, so those, you know, were conversations that were happening. So making sure that the funding is there so that we can continue to do that. Um, but like I said, I think um, the conversation really needs to continue and we need to explore um, what else can be done. Uh, I'd like to add too that uh, our affiliate, we, we actually leverage more local dollars, uh, district dollars, uh, but I believe that there are some HUD pass through grants that you can leverage uh, to take that to the next level as a developer to a passive house or sustainable. So um, from the uh, kind of like implementation side of things of Passive House, there are actually quite a few local programs available. They are not bad at all, like $10,000, $20,000. They are mostly coming through uh, grid financing, grid programs right now. 
and uh, it's not specifically necessarily for pacifiers. I believe only Massachusetts went that round. They they for retrofits to that level, they had some money available in the kind of like twenty thirty thousand dollar range. But um, the zero energy home uh, ready home program that has various relationships with utility programs. So and because our certification also uh, doubles as a, uh, that certification as well, we automatically gain that label as well. Uh, that makes passive houses also eligible for the zero energy ready home uh, programs. Actually, questions for Greg mostly on multifamily side. Have you guys done anything? And then on the single family home, if I understand how your financing is correct, you're basically purchasing the system for the home buyer, so the home buyer ends up owning the system. That do I have that correct? Yes. So we traditionally do installs on single family homes, although we are looking to move into the multifamily world. Um, we have a couple pilot projects that we're um, developing right now um, to see how we can take this model into the multifamily world. Um, I, and we're doing a lot of that work at our headquarters level. Um, so, and actually you start to bridge a lot of different policies when you go into multifamily and sometimes, well, a lot of times is that it's, we're looking at rental communities too. So we're not necessarily looking at homeowners. Um, and then the second part for financing. Um, so you basically asked, what was the question again? I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, they do have the system in hand. Uh, there's a couple caveats to that. Um, in California, they absolutely own the systems outright um, because we're uh, starting to leverage the federal income tax credits. Um, it actually has, they have to be held by a third party um, for five years so that those tax credits can be leveraged. Um, so tax credits are tricky, so they might not be the best um, long-term route. Um, so, and then ultimately, the, they are provided to the homeowners for free um, unless they participate in the, the pay it forward program that I discussed and we're actually looking to see how we can roll that out and more um, more opportunities around that um, because we found that if the homeowner does have a little bit of skin in the game um, whether it be just a hundred bucks a year um, they actually have a little bit more um, uh, ownership and connection to the system rather than if we had just given it to them for free other questions? So, oh, yes, sir. So Richard Hoy, I'm a retired firefighter and uh, wood energy advocate. Uh, the, uh, the passive house uh, concept is that uh, are there limits to the uh, design of the house to get approval? For instance, could I get a, a, a small mansion that is energy efficient and, and meets uh, the, the energy criteria? Is that certified, and what uh, are you are you employing anything to uh, encourage um, accessory apartment design so that a, a house of a modest size could uh, offer homes to two families uh, in the event that that's appropriate? Not turn on. Uh, under the existing program, we're, we're trying to move away from that a little bit, but under the existing uh, program right now, you can certify essentially a Mac mansion, which uh, kind of is a little funky because like a 10,000 square foot home with two people in it. Um, they actually get a bonus because they they have a, a surface to volume ratio that is very good and, and they kind of like almost have to make less of an effort to meet the same standard. And we're trying to correct for that right now in our work with the Department of Energy because we feel that's not really an equitable solution. Uh, but then your second uh, question, it's um, we generally um, encourage people for accessi uh, uh, accessory dwelling units to, to put them in because uh, it is actually more efficient. Like uh, if you have higher density, it makes it easier to meet the standard. And if you have a very, very small single family home that's stand, stand alone, uh, it's, it's inherently less efficient than if you have like two units that are, that are clustered. So that's, that, that's a very much supported solution. Thank you.
just add to that, excuse me. Uh, so DC Habitat actually, the, the third, one of the three phases uh, for, that we're doing in Ivy City in the Passive House, it's actually the entire envelope of the three buildings, uh, just because it's a little easier to do that. Uh, instead of individual units, it's just one, seen as one giant building. Uh, so it's about 6,000 square feet in total. Uh, are any of these programs, including the, uh, uh, the uh, solar energy program, are they uh, constrained geographically or use? For instance, could I uh, have my second home uh, certified or supported, or can I get a home built on a coastline uh, that's subject to uh, damage? Could I get those programs supported or certified? Well, um, excellent question again. Um, it, uh, it seems not very logical, right? If you if you talk about like an equitable energy economy and you say like, okay, really we should have like energy consumption per person, like something like similar to the 2000 Watt Society, kind of putting that in perspective, uh, then uh, inherently somebody with two homes would actually like double the energy consumption. But what we find is actually really pretty cool. Um, if you have a passive building as your second home, or passive house, uh, you can essentially shut everything off. Uh, the pipes won't freeze because you have the passive solar gain. Uh, temperatures will drop probably only like to about like mid 40, 45, some mid 40 somewhere in there. So it's essentially if you're not there, you're not using any energy. So in that sense, yeah, we do certify second homes. Um, we we think that's that's fine. You you only use energy when you're there. So yeah, and it's not limited to any region. It works everywhere. In terms of building on coastal areas i mean i think that would depend on the um, community and the zoning laws and what what uh, communities are looking at in terms of making the whole community more resilient which i think there are a lot of cities uh kind of reevaluating that right now is there a question in the back So I actually have a project locally that would meet most of the criteria of the class of They can talk to me after. But I have a question, because uh, I come at it from a market rate perspective, and um, your two business models are both kind of non-profit based. Are you aware of any, a lot of the challenges are financial, and they can do all these uh, buildings differently. Are there any programs that you guys are aware of or policies that would improve cash flow? Because cash flow becomes one of the dominant factors whether or not you can purchase uh, A lot of the solar programs aren't necessarily, it's a credit, it doesn't necessarily help cash flow. Uh, and then there's depreciation, which makes it possible, or SREX, which are production based, which also makes it from a policy perspective, which they don't have cash flow. So you guys are aware of any kind of cash flow policies that help? I'm assuming you're asking for from a for-profit perspective yeah because yeah, I mean I obviously am working on cash flow issues for nonprofit, <laughs> and um, yeah but at the same time we're able to build relationships with third-party financers that are able to do um, upfront monetizing um, particularly of the SREX and that's actually a service that is available um, across the market um, and we're also working with a third-party financer to monetize um, federal income tax credits. So if that's something that you can take advantage of, I don't know if a for-profit company would be able to monetize it up front, but it's certainly something to explore. Yeah, it, it's, it's a little bit, yeah, although we do search and uh, we do have to find that financing gap uh, for the development costs, uh, that's where we're able to leverage some of the local monies, like the Housing Production Trust Fund that I mentioned earlier. Uh, to really take us to the next level. Uh, other ways of that we fundraise is we find corporate sponsors, uh, and then we also sell the properties uh, to capture back the, any any construction costs. And I know in terms of um, some of the new programs, well, at least for efficiency, there's the warehouse uh, for energy efficient energy efficiency loans, which is trying to uh, partner both uh, public funds and private capital uh, to develop these efficiency programs. Um, that's fairly new. There's on-bill financing, utility on-bill financing. Again, looking to, 
for that source of capital to be able to create these loan programs that can uh, be, you know, very uh, doable for the homeowner because you do the efficiency upgrades and presumably they're paying back the loan on their utility bill, but they're not, it, it won't cost them any more than if the, uh, they uh, still had the, in, the energy waste they had before. And I would just add one more thing to that. Um, I mean, a lot of the local programs that we're working with uh, are still uh, available to for-profit developers. Um, it's just we take advantage of it uh, because we can, and for-profit developers also take advantage of it. And these are usually um, incentive programs, whether it be upfront or uh, you know a rebate. It just depends how it's set up in the locality. Yeah, just, just one comment. This might just be a related um, uh, program. Um, the Department of Energy just released a new program, which is called the Lender uh, Agreement. Um, and uh, essentially what they're trying to do is they're bringing the lenders together and uh, arguing for that efficient homes or certified homes have inherent value and for them to essentially agree to give you more money in advance, like in anticipation of these homes being more durable, less subject to mold, blah, blah, blah no risk, uh, less risk, a uh, homeowner has more money to pay off the loan, so on and so forth. So um, that is brand new. They are soliciting partners right now, so we're anticipating, we're a partner in that one as well, we're anticipating that to, to really uh, help financing some of those projects. That's a critical uh, point and a very good question because that is really what makes this sustainable, sustainability being environmental, economic, and, and social. So um, thank you. Yes, sir. Some of the programs that you enunciated might be available to them, but you take advantage of because you have to, and they have to don't. But where uh, they would avail themselves of such programs, I don't know that someone who's building a $400,000 home is going to reduce the uh, sale price of it because they were able to energize, to efficiently energize their home in its production. Whereas you won't build such a home, but of course you'll you're offering cost savings to the buyers or to owners who are living there now. It's a completely different market for people who want to profit from the folks who want to profit in a larger sense than their pocket book. The only thing I would add to that is that in my previous life, I worked at the Virginia Housing Development Authority, and um, we did work on what we sort of termed green mortgages, which allowed for people to qualify for um, homes that were out of their price range if they were more energy efficient um, or if they had clean energy um, installed uh, because that would be factored into the monthly cost. And so they would figure out you know, what the average utility bill would be and increase that onto the mortgage so their mortgage would ultimately over a 30 year span um, be larger than what they would normally qualify for. So there are mechanisms out there for market rate affordability and sustainability. Um, obviously that's not something that we're taking advantage of in this particular program, but I think just to sort of continue the conversation around whether or not we can make it affordable, there are definitely uh, mechanisms out there. One other thing I will mention is that there is an organization here in DC called DC Sun and they aggregate solar purchasing so that really brings down the cost of um, the panels themselves and so they'll do a community they'll go to a community and see if they try to they'll try to get as many um, people interested in purchasing at the same time and then they get a number of contractors signed on board and the costs will go way down because they're doing it at scale. Any studies uh, done on uh, the enhancement to the local economy of this approach, the potential uh, data sets that would show uh, to policymakers that there is a community advantage to uh, keeping dollars local uh, by not going to utility companies, coal companies, and so on. There is that advantage to being car free uh, if you are spending more locally. Uh, is there? Perspective on this that's in in the in the literature. 
Well, we've only done two so far, and we're doing six more. So hopefully we'll have a nice study uh, once those six are complete in IBC, uh, how that actually impacts IBC itself. Uh, but in terms of how it in impacts the, com the, the pocket of the owner, that, that's already been done, uh, at least with our homeowners, uh, that they're putting down that money, uh, paying down that mortgage, and it's actually helping them which is really our key goal, is really helping the homeowners become sustainable themselves, uh, not uh, live dollar to dollar. Yeah, and I think uh, you would expect that that trickles down to the whole community, like if the homeowner, uh, him or herself, is more stable and can actually maintain homeownership and is not forced out of the home because of lack of resources, failing to pay the mortgage. So I would expect this to definitely show uh, great results as soon as we have larger de communities developed and we have more data. And I think that's a, uh, a st statistic that over time we'll be able to follow a lot closer um, and like how many families stay in the homes that we do the installations on. Uh, it just, it's been a short amount of time since we've started. So um, the one thing I would add is that, you know, we can say that we've created 1,500 jobs. And so that is major impact to the local economy. Terry. Put, take energy efficient buildings right? and you really reduce the energy use and then you can make them approach you for producing the solar panel. Are you looking anywhere uh, further out like Maryland and uh, New Jersey and Connecticut and uh, California? They're all looking at the impact of distributed generation on the grid. Right? So it's interesting to think about the dramatic reduction in usage as a result of building this house, putting generation on the top. And you think in terms of a, like a city block full of these houses, dramatic reductions on the generation demand on the grid. So now you've got a, a little microgrid, right? So, is that, are you working to think about how that would impact on the total design of the existing grid? So I would say we're very, very early in any sort of phase of discussions around that. Um, we typically design our systems to cover about 75 to 80% of the energy cost in the home. So we don't normally uh, design a system to go produce energy past the amount that they use. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that, but we don't know what's gonna happen with the passive homes um, because they are so much more efficient. And we designed the systems to be the same size as they would for a typical energy efficient home. So ultimately they will produce at least 100% of the energy costs, if not more. And so we'll just have to see over time um, you know what that starts to look like and you know watch those meters spin backwards and what that really means to sort of those communities that we're working in so it's exciting next briefing <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming today in this miserable weather and um, let me uh, please join me in thanking our panel again for the wonderful presentation